Good afternoon, faculty, staff, students, and friends. My name is Jordan Pierre, and I'm currently a senior majoring in broadcast and digital journalism with a minor in entrepreneurship and emerging enterprise. To be here today for me is much more than a ceremony. Today is much more significant because I come from a place where I've attended more funerals and court appearances than college graduations. To be here today is a barrier broken. I have my family in attendance today, and for many of them, this is the first time they have attended a college graduation. Right. Earning the opportunity to walk across this stage required much more than just passing classes. For what makes this institution rigorous, at least for us black and brown students, is not the curriculum, but what comes with being black in the context of America while trying to uphold academic excellence. It's not the curriculum that makes this college experience rigorous. It's occupying academic buildings and being sent suspension letters for advocating for the creation of policies that will hold every student accountable for the racial slurs and vandalism of the dorms we black students lived in. It's not the curriculum that makes these courses rigorous. It's bearing witness to your black woman friends having a focus on academia while learning they have been stripped of their agency to choose whether to give birth or not, despite having the highest mortality rate. It's not the curriculum that makes these courses rigorous. It's being a first generation college student and not having the ability to call home to seek guidance on how to navigate the collegiate space for you're the first to do so. It's not the curriculum that makes these courses rigorous. It's being a black student in an educational system that justifies the admission of black history through the use of the discomfort it causes our white counterparts when class discussions reveal the true history of theirs. It's not the curriculum that makes these courses rigorous. It's studying abroad in London while 10 elderly black men and women are killed in top supermarket, just some miles away from here, simply because they were black. It's not the curriculum that makes these courses rigorous. It's having to work three jobs on campus to pay your rent and assist your parents in paying theirs. Some of us in this room understand firsthand that the scholarships and financial aid we earned were not just funding us as students, they were funding our household and a community. It's not the curriculum that makes these courses rigorous, it's looking at the news and seeing someone that looks like you with the same name Jordan being choked to death by a former Marine on a subway station and witnessing his mental health being used to justify his death. I say this all to emphasize the danger of a single narrative story the danger of being left to formulate a preconceived notion of a community based on westernized media, and the danger of having a seat at the table to tell your own story. I often say that it's easy to dream, but it's hard to aspire to occupy a space that you have never seen someone that looks like you in. My presence here today will serve as proof to the next young black man or woman that despite what comes with being a black student at Syracuse University, it's possible to speak at the Newhouse graduation. There was a time when I did not know what a student marshal was until last year when I met a black woman named Adudu, a student marshal at the College of Engineering and Computer Science. There was a time when I did not believe I was gonna be the President of the United States, which is what I will one day become, until I seen Barack Obama become the President. My presence today will stand as a symbol of inspiration for the black people who hear this speech will be able to see themselves in a position I am in and aspire to do the same. I challenge my fellow graduates who are not of color to be mindful and intentional with the stories that you share, normalize and teach your children. For those stories are used to formulate a preconceived notion of who we are based on the narratives you teach and the environments you expose them to. I challenge my fellow brothers and sisters to also be intentional and thoughtful about the stereotypes we normalize and perpetuate amongst ourselves. James Baldwin once stated that if the world does it to you long enough and effectively enough, you begin to do it to yourself. You become an accomplice to your own murderers. We must ensure that we do not become that accomplice and use our platforms to empower one another. To Syracuse and to Newhouse, I challenge you all to take accountability for the trajectory the media has taken. It is not one we should be proud of. For if we take pride in being the number one communication school, we must also take ownership of the leaders and content creators for the media we consume. 
especially as we produce those who are the head of the newsroom. So we are only a microcosm of what the world will become. I challenge us all here today to denounce the stereotypes we have of one another, for the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but incomplete. As the legendary Nipsey Hussle once stated, the marathon continues. My name is Louise Dente, and I welcome you to yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. On this edition is a special, as we are joined by Jordan Pierre. He is a graduate of Syracuse University and also a previous guest on our show four years ago as he was still in Eagle Academy, Brooklyn, New York. Welcome back, Jordan. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's, it's great to see everything come back full circle. You know what I mean? Four years before and four years after. And, you know, I think one of the key things here is you basically had to take all of the info, things that you learned as being a student and use that. How did, was your um, impact of your training prior to going into college helped you to deal with college life? So my impact of the training, you know, like what I did prior to get in Eagle Academy going into Syracuse, um, the importance of understanding first your identity, um, going to an old boys school like Eagle Academy was divided into houses that was named after six prominent black leaders. I was a part of Ronald McNair and I had to understand the history of who Ronald McNair was, but also the history of all the prominent black leaders in which the school houses were named after. Um, understanding your history, there's two forms of education, right? I was reading the um, book, Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Wilson. And the first one is the one that's taught within the classroom. The second one is the one that you learn through self-pursuit. And the, the latter is usually the one that's more important. So as you learn them, and at the latter, when I say the pursuit of your own is just understanding Black history. There's certain dialogue and conversation that would not be held in the classroom around Black history, um, understanding our contribution to the world, and knowing that everything started with the Black with black people. So um, it's like reinstoring our agency, understanding our identity, where it is that we come from, because we are victims of not only a stolen legacy, but also being stripped of our agency and our form of identity. And I often say that there's uh, the way to make a, a man or or to make someone assimilate is two ways. One is either strip them of the history and the second one is to prevent them access to it. And unfortunately, we just happen to be victims of both. So we have been limited exposure to our history. We also have limited access to it. Tell us some of the challenges that you've seen other students of color um, have in terms of navigating a new environment? I mean, the first one is when we raise, we raise an environment. And I want to say we, when I say we, young men that come, young black men and women of color and, or, or black specifically, when we are raised in certain environments um, that's like low income households or, or poverty driven neighborhoods, we live in an environment that don't necessarily reaffirm us in our vision. So in many ways, it's, when we hear an older generation speaking upon the things in which we do now, you start to understand that we first have to understand the system of accountability because we learn from someone, right? And when you raise an environment where it's not necessarily reaffirming your vision, it's hard to maintain a form of self-efficacy. And what self-efficacy is a firm confidence in your capabilities and your 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 agency to make things happen, right? Um, so it's hard because you're in an environment where you don't, where everybody else, or you learning more about what you should not do based on the actions that you're seeing rather than things that you should do. So a lot of us grow up in environments where we may not have role models and people that we aspire to be like, but people we don't aspire to be like. Um, and learning how to how to take some things from each person. So what I will say is it, it takes a village. I often say that it takes a community to raise a child. Um, but that community don't necessarily have to look one way, but they do have to share a common mission, which is one of equity. So one of the struggles that I see young men first face is being in an environment we feel like we don't have any um, form of assistance or those that's willing to, to guide us. Another thing I would say that a lot of young men face um, in many ways is spaces where I felt it as well, where you don't necessarily feel reaffirmed in your existence and your agency. We have a common quote that we hear a lot of people say, which is be mindful how you treat those on your way up because those are the same people you're going to meet on your way down. But the way in which the quote should be worded is that you need to be mindful how you treat children on your way up because those will be the same children you meet on your way down. And we are in a time period where we have access to much more information at a younger age. So we're going to get to certain places and plateaus that it took y'all longer to get to. So how you treat us as a child, how we going to eventually when the tables turns, how we going to treat you? Or, or you have to understand what it is that you pour into a child is what they're going to pour into your children. 
And many people have said it in different ways. I say it in my way, which I'm saying is be my father to your children on your way up because those same children going to be on your way down. But we heard Tupac say it, and the way he stated it was the hate you give. Um, and it was thug life. And it was like the hate you give little infants comes back to F everybody. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, you're saying what you pour into a child is what's going to be poured into the world. You, it's hard for you to, to love when you haven't been loved. It's hard for you to be courageous when you never seen someone be courageous. It's hard to learn how to treat a woman right when you never had a male figure in your life to learn from the example to which they treat a woman. So that that was one example. But we heard in many different ways to which you see it exists. And then there's an African proverb that says, a child that does not feel embraced by a village will burn it down and fill his womb. Mm. And I think that's what we're living in right now. We see young men. Mm -hmm. um, we, we might be killing each other and things like that. But it's all in regards to feeling seen and feeling loved. Mm. You know what I mean? And if you don't reaffirm us or we don't get reaffirmed in the positive things, we're going to turn to outlets that reaffirm us in general. It's not about whether it's right or wrong. It's just being feeling seen and feeling like you love. So whether that's in the street, you see it. Whenever we have a fight or a confrontation, how much we reaffirm that, oh, yeah, he liked that. They, they are reaffirming all the wrong things because all the space that we're supposed to be reaffirming our young men in the positive things, they're not doing so. We have teachers and educators that's making students feel as if it's unattainable to, mm. achieve, to even attend Syracuse, to attend Harvard, to attend mm. Yale. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, we talk about affirmative action. So we live in a society where, you know what I mean, it, they are making different steps and efforts and taking measures to eradicate our presence. So we don't feel love. We don't feel seen. So in many ways, that is the, the byproduct of what we see today. The, what we see today is a byproduct of that system that's not pouring in love and support of children. As you know, just recently, the Supreme Court voted down affirmative action. Um, which was for some a way of getting into doors that were previously closed due to racism. What do you feel about that? Any, you know, any? Yeah, I share my thoughts. So one thing about affirmative action: um, one, I, I charge a, a, I charge a, a system of accountability to those that are journalists that are of color. Um, I, it's our role, no matter what spaces we occupy, to use the knowledge we have obtained to further the progression of our people. So as journalists, um, we start to understand that in media, they use certain vernacular and diction where they speak about certain topics so that we don't understand it, right? Um, affirmative action. I didn't know what that was until I did my own research and I had to use lots of my platform to educate my peers. Affirmative action is only bills and policies in place to ensure that there's equitable enrollment and admission into collegiate spaces. Now that that's no longer something that, it's, it was only a system of accountability and a criteria to hold people accountable to. Now that we no longer have that system in place, you use Syracuse. Syracuse, you ask them or any institution, how many black students do you have enrolled? They're going to tell you the rate and the percentage of students of color. Students of color is not black. That's different. Two different things. I don't know who you categorize as people of color. I actually how many black students you have enrolled. But now they already did not keep the statistics. Now they have a, Now they don't have to be held accountable for not doing so. You feel me? So in my ways, I feel like that was, a, that was strategic. But we also have to understand who benefits from our political absence? The reason why I said I aspire to become the president because I understand the the effects of us not being politically um, knowledgeable for us not having the seats of power because policy um, we fail to accurately understand or effectively understand what policy is in law. And if you want to live in America as a black man, you need to understand law. Your speech, powerful speech you made at Syracuse University really reverberated across the country and perhaps the world. Tell me about what inspired you and what has been the impact of this speech in your terms like that. Just talk to us about that for a moment. Uh, I wrote the speech two years ago during my junior year, fall semester, I was all coming to Alpha. At that time, that spring semester prior to the fall, I had witnessed what the Black graduation was, which is something that we have at Syracuse, where it's a graduation catered towards students of color specifically. And then we have the graduation with the school, which is of everyone. Um, when I seen that as a as a junior, go, well, sophomore, going into my junior year, I, I wrote down my goals, right? That's something that we do as alphas, write down your goals, what are the things that you want to achieve prior to graduating. One of the goals was to speak at the Black graduation. Um, there was a time period where I just had time, and, and God used me as a messenger, and, and words came to paper. And one of the things I wanted to speak upon was the existence of what it is that we have to face outside the institution? And that's when a rhetoric and a poetic strategy or technique where I kept saying it's not the courses that make this experience within this institution rigorous, it's being Black in the context of America. Then I broke it down through different instances explaining what that context of being Black in America looks like outside of the institution. Um, and then, so I, I started that in my junior year. As time progressed, as you can see, because if you listen to the speech, 
I mentioned things that happened at different time periods. I mentioned Roe v. Wade. That's more recent with Ron DeSantis, but also was happening two years ago as well with the conversation started. Um, I mentioned the Buffalo shooting in, in Syracuse, uh, in Buffalo, the Buffalo shooting at Top Supermarket. I mentioned that that was when I was studying abroad this past summer in London. I had stopped the class and actually had to make sure the teacher had a conversation around that. Then I spoke about um, I spoke about Jordan Nelly. That's more timely. That's something that occurred recently. I spoke about financial aid and different things that happened within a two year span. So if anybody listens to the speech, will understand that there's no way I could have wrote that speech today because I had to, I wrote different parts of the speech as if, I, I forgot what type of book it is, but we write different parts of a speech in order to make it a, a cohesive one piece, right? So that's exactly what that speech was. Um, I wrote that year two years ago. So now fast forward to my senior year, I I I learned that I did not um, get selected to speak at the Black graduation. He formulated a student committee of Black students, of students of color, and they didn't pick me. I felt the way because I felt like as a young man on campus that had been building black congregation using my platform as such, there's no way that, I, when I wrote in my junior year by default, I knew I was gonna speak at black graduation. Like no way I don't speak, I'm the face of Syracuse. That's just what it is. And when I learned that I didn't speak, I was mad. Uh, I'm like, how did not I get chosen to speak by my own people for the black graduation yet Newhouse, which is predominantly white, felt like I was adequate enough to hold that mantle. I called my homegirl Ari, I asked Ari, I said, Ari, how do you know when God is redirecting you from when he's putting you in position to rule? She said, when you put forth all your effort and the outcome is still out of your control, that's when you know God is redirecting. Because nobody could say, Jordan, that you should have done anything else for Syracuse. There's nothing else that you could have done to solidify that spot. You did everything plus some. So I understood that. I said, that's a good one. I like that, Ari. She said, just because you have been loyal and faithful to the institution does not mean that what you envision as a reward for the work that you have been sowing is what God envisioned. So don't think that often we have prayers and when we pray and we have an idea that we want to manifest out of those prayers. But a lot of times those prayers may not be in alignment with what God wants from us. So she said, after hearing which the context of what you want to speak to, I think that your speech actually would be more powerful in front of the Newhouse graduation um, audience, which is white people, and not in front of the black graduation because it's like, we heard that before. Don't cast your pearls among swan. We heard that before. So if you say it amongst the demographic, it will evoke much more dialogue. And she said, maybe God is not actually to change your speech, but to say it amongst a different demographic. And at that time is when, when she said, I went back to that speech I wrote two years ago, because at first I was going to write a whole new speech. I went back to that speech two years ago. And um, that's the speech that I said. I changed a few things to make it more timely with Jordan Nilly, Roe v. Wade, things like that. That just happened more current. And, and that's what came to fruition. What has been the aftermath of um, whatever you care to share of the worlds of, of listening? After listening to speech, what has happened to you? My life has definitely changed. Um, I've increased a following. I have built a village of people that's in support of my narrative of understanding this fight for equity. Um, I believe that many of us think that the civil rights movement has ended, but it's definitely still at the flow today. It's still many things that need to be confronted. And I think because, I don't think, because I am a young man, um, it came to a surprise to see me speak as eloquent and as effective as I did. Because for some reason, I don't know why society think that because we are young, that we don't understand what's going on. I'm 22, ain't that young. It's, it, you can be effectively educated and of course, always room to learn, always a need for mentorship. Um, so in regards, many people have reached out for me to come speak to their students. Um, to many adverse universities, administration, foundations have extended the invitation for me to come speak, which I will do. But I always let people know and give them a disclaimer that when I come, I speak truth. That speech is only a glimpse of who I am as a person. Tell me about some of the suggestions you have for the parent who's sitting there trying to motivate little Johnny or little Sally to go to college, go to school, you know, as well as the student about to embark on a four-year graduate degree. First, let's start with the student who's in um, high school. What suggestions you have? What do they do? It's, it's many things. There's so many lessons I learned throughout my four years. Um, I would say during your freshman year, it's important to establish a network. So... If you wasn't coming to Syracuse with me, I know everybody from the from the janitor to the people that's in food services to admissions to you come to Syracuse, I know everybody. 
And you have to be strategic and intentional, understanding that wherever spaces you occupy, find those people that are going to be in your supportive cast. Because there's going to be times where you question your identity, where you question your belonging. So find people that can provide you that reassurance and understanding that you do belong here during times of questioning. So that's the first thing I'm going to say is find those that serve as those mothers away from home, those fathers away from home, their family members and relatives away from home. Because I mean, definitely if you're going away from school, even going to any school, you need to find a network that's going to be there that will serve as your village to reassure you during times when you may not feel a self a firm sense of reassurance. Um, that's the first, right? That was my first year experience. The second one is I was saying embrace fear. Um, no matter as you continue to like, I, I'm scared. I'm not like like I don't have a fear of the consequences that comes with being unapologetically black and speaking truth. Because I've seen what happens through history. Any of our leaders that spoke that is is an all time threat to America. So I already know what what's to come. But what they say is courage is not actions that made in the absence of fear. It's it's courage is the actions that's made in the midst of fear. So embrace the fear of being uncomfortable in the space, the fear of not feeling like you belong, the fear of thinking that you had a disadvantage. Because in those moments where your courage will show. So what I want you to dream big, but make sure you reaffirm yourself and don't allow nobody to deter your focus or make you feel like your dream is unattainable. People put an applause on the amount of, they put a they put a cap on the amount of applause they give you, but never on the amount of criticism. There's a time where many people tell me, oh, his head too big. Don't, don't, don't gas him too much or don't give him too much of the applause. His head already too big. But they never put a cap on the amount of criticism they give you. They had criticized you forever. But they had never, they they had a cap how much applause they give, but never the amount of criticism. So that's what I would say to parents. We affirm your child, understand the importance. Um, because tables gonna turn. That's inevitable. And then for everybody, I'll say, like I stated earlier, is that it takes a village. And that village don't have to look one way, but we must share the same mission, which is that of effort. If you had an opportunity to tell your parents something to Thank them for what they've given you. What would you want to say to them right now? My parents. Ooh, I got a village. I got to name a couple people. But my mom, I would thank her for always keeping me in compassion. I never seen my mom ever close the door, turn her eye, turn her back towards anybody. She always had open arms. Like, I never understood how my mom would do that. I didn't see any things that, and people do certain things and try to use it, and she ain't never, ever hold no type of grudge or stop showing love. And I think that's important. It's something that we don't see often today where people try to encourage you to, to cut bridges, leave those behind that can't go with you. My mom ain't never, I never see my mom do that. Then when I say to my stepfather's discipline, I want to be the young man I am today and the importance of fathers. There's some things that only a child can learn from their father. A woman has been doing a great job, but there's some things a child can only learn from their father and understand the importance of fathers. So I would say to all my black men, the biggest things I always advocate for is to understand that you contribute much more to this world than just money. Don't allow no woman or any force in this world to make you think that the only contribution you make to the society is monetary. You contribute wisdom, love, support, and guidance. And we need you. You know what I mean? It's, that's that's another thing that's going on today. A lot of the young men, we don't have fathers. I need my pops. I thank my stepfather and my father every day. My stepfather took on a role of raising a child that wasn't his and effectively educating me on how you navigate this world as a black man. Then my family. Mm -hmm. They came to my graduation. We all wore these shirts, right, this shirt right here. It says mm -hmm. on the bottom, mm -hmm. I can't hold because I have a community dependent on me. Wow. And that day, that was the most, that was the most memorable part for me. It seemed, I can't hold because I have my community dependent on me. I had my family. They came on a party bus, mm -hmm. 30 deep. We all was there. Everybody. I'm the only black family probably in Newhouse at that speech. Wow. But to understand how important it is to know that you got people in your corner. So if it come down to it, I know I got my, my mm -hmm. kids. Beautiful. And that's something, a foundation. So we see you, we see your family, we see your ancestors, you are the sum total of that. And that's why it's so important. So we want to not only acknowledge your work, but your family for providing, as well as your extended family, for providing you with the platform of which you proudly stand. And um, I just wanted to, for those who want to know, what is the next step for you at this point? You've gotten your video. Yes. Yeah. The next step, I am in graduate school. Um, I feel like that's a way of God keeping me grounded. Despite all that's going on, I still have something I need to fulfill. Um, so that's one. The second thing, I have different initiatives that I'm going to build back in Brooklyn. One of the biggest ones I want to do, it. I call it a, I want to do, I'm going to say Expo. At first I was saying Black Male Expo, but I do want Black and Black men in one, actually. And I want to do it on Tonkins Avenue. I want to bring 
I want to show how we exist outside of the narratives through media. I want to bring doc black doctors, black lawyers, black entrepreneurs. I want to bring everybody black. And I want to, and my role is going to be to bring the youth. But I just need to get the older representation for us to understand how we exist outside of what we normalize. We are not just entertainers and athletes. We are much more than that. And I want to, I want to show the youth that come from where I come from that it's much bigger than what we've been exposed to. And the last thing I'll say is that there's two forms of incarceration. The first one is to be a victim of limited exposure. And the first one is actually be incarcerated. The second one is to be a victim of limited exposure. And coming from where I come from, we have been victims of limited exposure. So the, the the importance and power of exposure is something that we've been um, not placing the right value to. So you gotta you can't try to get a young man to change his actions while keeping him in the same environment to which he adapted those characteristics in order to survive. So for me, exposure is important. I'm gonna bring the exposure here. I want to be a talk show, but also the president. And the president, I want to be the president to show the world that you could do it. Uh, Barack Obama gave us hope for sure, but. I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna show that. It's possible to come from Brooklyn, New York, Gates Avenue, low income community, and make it happen. Well, you know, let me just say, you have walked the walk, talked the walk, and shown us an example of a strong young man standing on truth, standing on history and culture. And that's why we are proud and the world is proud in acknowledging you. So I am very, um, very excited for you. Um, because I know that we need those bright lights of hope that you instill and you've shared with lots of people and you will continue to share. And you know that you have a home here with Cultural Caravan because we are so thankful that we had a chance to meet you back as a undergrad before you got there and that you're continuing to do the work. So again, on behalf of Cultural Caravan, I wanna sincerely thank you for joining us I want to um, encourage you to continue the work and let you know that your family here of Cultural Caravan will continue to salute and support the work you do. All right. Stay, keep going forth, my brother. Got you. Thank you again. I appreciate it.